that I see, uh, Dana, our president, and Sandra on our board of directors. Um, and uh, so thanks everybody for coming out tonight for rethinking Wabanaki history in Maine and New England. And I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer McCutcheon is an assistant professor of history at the University of Southern Maine, where she teaches courses in Native American history and early United States history. She currently is teaching online, but is anxious to return to the classroom. She moved to Maine in 2019 and is enjoying being in New England and learning about Native American history and culture here. I took a class with Dr. McCutcheon last year. Was it last year? It seems like so long ago. It seems like a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, but where we looked at Native American history and culture through the lens of gender. And I can promise you that you are in store for an informative and enjoying presentation. The talk will be, like Melanie said, about 45 minutes, and we will take some questions, many questions as Dr. McCutcheon can fit in, um, if you want to put those in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, Dr. McCutcheon. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Catherine, and thank you for hosting me and having me uh, this evening. I've been looking forward to this for a really long time since uh, we had originally planned to do this presentation in April. Um, but hey, better late than never, right? So thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to first start with a land acknowledgement. Even though we're coming together online from our homes across the state of Maine and perhaps broader New England, I want to acknowledge that the Biddeford Historical Society and the MacArthur Library are located on the traditional territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. We recognize and honor the current tribes who comprise the Wabanaki Confederacy, who has stewarded this land throughout generations. We respect the traditional values of these tribes and acknowledge their inherent sovereignty in this territory. We support their efforts for land and water protection and restoration, and we uh, support the ongoing work of decolonization in Maine and beyond. So thank you again for joining us this evening. I am going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint for you. Um, and like what Catherine said in the introduction, if you have any questions for me for the question and answer session, just put them in the chat box that's at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be able to get to those um, in the last 15 or 20 minutes of the presentation tonight. So let me go ahead and share. Okay. All right, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Good, okay. All right, so the title of our presentation tonight is Rethinking Wabanaki History in Maine and New England. And when I teach about Wabanaki history or native history in general in my classes, I always try to challenge my students to flip their perspective. I remind them that in traditional US history courses, the narrative always begins in Europe and moves westward. So we follow Columbus and the pilgrims and generations of immigrants across the Atlantic to the shores of North America. From here, we follow their settlement and expansion westward across the continent, highlighting moments like the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark Expedition and the admittance of new states into the Union. And we celebrate this West word expansion uh, as something that has shaped our national character and shaped our identity. But it really overlooks a lot of very important people and important viewpoints that are very much an important part of shaping history in our narratives of US history. Um, let me, all right, sorry about that. Um, so what I'm trying to say with this is that, you know, these westward facing histories that focus on this journey across the continent aren't really accurate descriptions of United States, States history because they overlook the important contributions and experiences of peoples who are not normally included in this dominant narrative like Native Americans and Native peoples. These westward facing narratives 
place Native peoples on the periphery of United States history, and they place Euro-Americans or white Americans at the center. So this is something that I talk a lot about, especially in the first weeks of my classes, whether I'm teaching a Native American history class, whether I'm teaching a US history class, and I encourage students to flip their perspective. And I ask them, what would happen? What would US history look like, or the history of New England, or the history of Maine, if we flipped our perspective to examine US history from an eastward facing perspective? What would these narratives look like if Native peoples were at the center and Europeans or Euro-Americans were the peoples on the periphery? So this idea has shaped the framework and the outline for my talk today. We'll, we're, we'll focus on rethinking Wabanaki history in Maine and New England, and we'll reorient our perspectives to try to understand this more from an indigenous perspective. And with most of you probably having lived in this region for a long time, you're probably somewhat familiar with local native history and myths and folklore. Legends like the curse of the Saco River have very much shaped our understanding of native culture and native history in the region. So tonight I want to talk about some of these things and we'll definitely talk about that, especially how different eastward facing perspectives of history that place native peoples at the center of some of these narratives can challenge us to think differently about people, places and events in history that we might think we're already very familiar with. So what I'm going to try to do is start with some broad themes, some big picture questions, and some larger ideas that will allow us to kind of tackle this question and place Wabanaki history in conversation with other themes in American history. From here, we'll kind of zoom into the local perspective. And since we only have a limited uh, amount of time tonight, I'm not going to really get into super specifics. I'm not going to really talk about specific events in King Philip's War, for example, or individual fights or conflicts during the revolution. But I want to focus more on larger ideas, larger frameworks that can help us just better understand Wabanaki history in the region. So according to Wabanaki oral histories, Wabanaki peoples have lived in the area now known as Maine and the Maritimes since time immemorial. The fact that the Wabanakis have maintained an uninterrupted presence on this land for thousands of years is a crucial component of Wabanaki culture and identity. Archaeological studies show that the Wabanaki have lived in this area for at least 12,000 years, making them the first residents of this land after the retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which was this massive sheet of ice that covered most of Canada and a large portion of the United States, most of the area that's pictured here on this map, which is Wabanaki traditional homeland and territory. The Wabanaki people are a confederacy of nations, which in the present day consists of five groups the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, and the Abenaki. When we refer to Wabanaki, we're referring to these tribes collectively. And it can be difficult to determine kind of the full extent of each nation's historical territory or traditional homeland, as the Western concepts of borders and land ownership that we're used to, especially when we look at a Western created map, did not exist in Wabanaki culture. But if you look at this map right here, and I'm going to actually go forward so you can see it a little bit better, a little bit more clearly, we see that the lines between these individual tribal territories are kind of blurred. But generally speaking, Abenaki homelands are located to the west of the Kennebec River, extending into New Hampshire, Vermont, and Quebec. Penobscot homelands are primarily located on the Penobscot River, extending south toward Kennebec. Passamaquoddy homelands are centrally located around the St. Croix River and the Passamaquoddy Bay, reaching the Penobscot River and Mount Desert Island. Maliseet homelands are located along the St. John River, stretching south to the St. Croix. And Mi'kmaq homelands are north of the St. John's River, extending throughout New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and Newfoundland. 
So each nation's territory on this map was very fluid and these territorial lines or boundaries kind of overlapped with one another on either side. These lines or boundaries could fluctuate depending on what animals were found in these lands in different seasons, what resources were um, available on these lands at certain times of the year. And so we even kind of see in the way that this map is created, which I think is really interesting, the lines between the colors here are blurred. They kind of run into one another. And that's a deliberate strategy that the, whoever created this map decided to take because it shows that, you know, the ways in which Native peoples and Wabanakis viewed their territory was pretty fluid. It wasn't going to be bound by rigid boundaries or, or rigid lines saying this is Mi'kmaq territory and this is Maliseet territory. Often these lines were fluid and the division of territory wasn't that important. All of these people shared resources with one another. They traveled throughout this area. They traveled throughout this region. And so it's really kind of important to understand, especially when we talk about a lot of the uh, European native conflicts or issues that might come up during a, uh, you know, history class on Wabanaki history, that the ways in which native peoples understood territory and the land around them was very, very different from how Europeans did. So the name Wabanaki is described is derived from Wabanakiak, which is based on the words Waban, which roughly translates to light and refers to the light of the dawn in the east, and Aki, which translates to land. So hence, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Wabanaki translates to people of the dawn land. And like I said in the previous slide, the idea of home or a homeland for Wabanaki peoples is very much tied to the ancestral use of lands and the ability to kind of move around where you needed to move around to in order to access resources. In other words, Wabanaki oral traditions, stories, and place names reflect this ancestral use of land, reflect the seasonal use of land. And it shows how Wabanaki peoples both today and in the past interacted with and used the landscape around them. To preserve history and maintain a connection to these lands, Wabanaki peoples in the present day work to preserve this intimate understanding of the landscape, continuing the practices of their ancestors at certain locations, during specific seasons, or at other important times of the year. This understanding and this mobility has shaped Wabanaki history and culture and has deeply influenced how Wabanaki peoples continue to be a very mobile people like their ancestors were. For generations, Wabanaki people travel seasonally, planting corn on riverbanks in the spring, harvesting fish on the coast and gathering berries during the summer, and hunting game in the woods during the winter time. They adapted to the region's gradually changing ecosystem, especially in those first years after the retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, becoming experts uh, at stone tool making, weaving baskets, creating snowshoes, and other cultural items that allowed them to become successful hunters and fishers. This provided Wabanaki peoples with, again, a very fluid definition of home that both historically and in the present day is often at odds with governmental attempts, both state or federal governmental attempts, to strictly define homelands and space for Native peoples, usually through reservations or other attempts at borders. So to give us a better idea of some of the things that I'm talking about, I just wanted to give you a visual here with this slide. Here are some images of a map depicting the state of Maine from a Wabanaki perspective. This map was created as part of a collaboration between Native peoples and non-Native peoples through the organization Maine Wabanaki Reach, which some, which some of you might be familiar with. And this canvas map, if you look at the image in the upper left-hand corner, is divided into multiple kind of interlocking sections. And it represents the many historical divisions that have ari arisen between Wabanaki peoples and Euro-Americans over the course of encounter between those two groups. But the surface of the map is as you see in some of these images below, uh, is decorated with flora and fauna imagery, some stamps uh, to create this really cool, interesting and deep uh, image that represents the environmental and cultural connections that Wabanaki peoples have to the land. So if we look at this map and look at these images, this definitely looks a lot different um, than a map that we might 
think of when we think of a Eastern or a Western creation created map of Maine. Um, but this is a map that explores and highlights what is important to Wabanaki peoples when they think about their homelands and when they think about the space in which they live. The Wabanaki are unique among Native American cultures within the boundaries of the United States because they're some of the very few tribes that were not removed or displaced from traditional territories in the colonial or in the post-colonial period. As stated before, this means that Wabanaki peoples have lived on the lands we now call Maine for about 12,000 years. And this is hugely significant, especially when we think about the impact of colonialism on Native peoples in the this region. Broadly, colonialism is defined as the act of one nation controlling another nation for economic gain. This is done by establishing settlements and exploiting those settlements and the land around those settlements for resources. But colonialism also has an effect on cultures, practices, and the ways of life of the peoples who are already living in these regions, in this case, Native Americans. Thinking about the colonial period in North America, Europeans, namely the French, the English, the Dutch here in New England, relied on local Native American populations to extract these resources that fueled their empire's larger economy. The French, the English, and the Dutch colonies all built economies that were based mainly on the fur trade and the lumber trade to a certain extent. They needed Native American hunters and guides who were knowledgeable of the geography, the terrain, seasonal animal migration patterns to assist them in gaining these goods. In exchange for serving as hunters, trappers, and guides, Native peoples received European trade goods and tools like guns and knives, which made these tasks easier, but also began to reshape Native ways of life. With guns, Native hunters were able to produce more animal furs, pelts, and skins for the European market, but war also became more deadly and more constant. And for a period of time, this near constant warfare, especially at the end of the 17th century, often led to the capture and sale of indigenous peoples as slaves. So native peoples would be captured as a part of warfare. They would be essentially taken to the nearest port city, usually Boston. And then from there, they would be sold and transported to the Caribbean to work on sugar plantations as enslaved peoples. Native Americans, as a result of all of these changes, began to realize that access to European weapons meant access to both protection in this new cross-cultural world, but it also meant that it was going to reshape ways of life and reshape decisions about alliances, diplomacy, politics, and who you would find yourself allying with in times of both war and peace. The emergence of the Wabanaki Confederacy was a direct result of the challenges and changes brought to Native American life as a result of these encounters with Europeans. While the peoples and cultures who make up the Wabanaki Confederacy, so all those tribes and nations that I listed at the beginning of the lecture, have lived in this region for thousands of years, the Wabanaki Confederacy itself is a relatively new entity formed around 1680. The creation of a political confederacy like the Wabanaki Confederacy was not uncommon during the late 17th century. By then, decades of war and conflict and just regular interactions with Europeans had introduced warfare and diseases to North America that ravaged Native American communities. Warfare began to shape for Native peoples across the continent, uh, ch began to change shape for Native peoples across the continent as, like I said before, guns and other weapons and technologies were introduced and Native populations became really enmeshed in these Atlantic trade networks where they were the providers of furs and skins and other goods that these European colonizers wanted. But disease was the major catalyst for this demographic change that we see among Native peoples around uh, following the, the years of first encounter. 
Scholars estimate that between 50 and 90% of the native population in Eastern North America died as a result of having no immunity to foreign diseases. And this is due to a phenomenon called virgin soil epidemic. This is a relatively new term coined in the 20th century, but it refers to an epidemic in which the populations at risk have had no previous contact with the diseases that strike them and therefore are immunologically almost defenseless. So pretty tough topical issue, I think I would say, for the current climate that we're in. But this, of course, leads to disease spreading at an extremely high rate, leading, unfortunately, to high mortality rates. And often, as we saw in North America with Native communities, Native peoples and, and communities in the interior of the continent would also be exposed to these diseases, but they would be exposed to these diseases before they even met or encountered the Europeans that actually brought them. And this kind of goes to a larger big picture uh, important thing to, to recognize about Native culture and life in this period, in this early encounter or pre-encounter period. And that's that Native peoples did not live in isolation from one another in the pre-colonial or early colonial era. Native North America was a place filled with extensive trade and communication networks. Peoples and goods traveled long distances from community to community, and Native peoples from a variety of cultures and backgrounds regularly interacted with one another for both peaceful and hostile purposes. So I think one of the myths that can be associated with Wabanaki history or Native history in general is that it's static and that Native peoples kind of exist as part of their own communities and especially in the era before colonization did not really interact with one another and that's very much not true. We know that um, Native Americans well into the interior of North America around modern day St. Louis were getting gold and exotic foods and other goods from the Aztec Empire before the arrival of the Europeans in the 15th century. So we know that these really extensive trade networks existed, and we obviously see that with the spread of disease following European contact. All of this is to say that disease altered native population demographics over the course of the 17th century, but widespread death as a result of this disease had a severe impact not only on native life and native families, but on the ways in which native peoples saw and interacted with the spiritual world. It led native peoples to question their existing belief systems and often their connections to the spiritual that really shook a lot of native communities to their core. Most native cultures, the Wabanaki included, believed that a precarious balance existed between the physical and the spiritual worlds. As a result, we see deep ritual practices surrounding many important events in Native American or Wabanaki life. For example, hunting or warfare had a ritual component. Childbirth, menstruation had ritual components to them. These ritual components were often gendered as well. But therefore, if something bad happened in in the physical world, many native cultures believed that it was due to the fact that their people were not respecting the ritual that accompanied that physical event. And that as a result, the spiritual world was out of balance with the physical world. And that was almost, they were experiencing this horrible thing on earth because it was punishment for the spirit from the spiritual world for them not doing what they were supposed to be doing and respecting that balance between the physical and the spiritual. So the widespread death caused by diseases during this period were extremely worrisome to Native peoples because from a Native perspective, if the majority of your family or community dies unexpectedly with no real evident cause, your immediate reaction is going to be that someone or something has thrown off the balance between the physical and the spiritual worlds and that these deaths are a warning to your community to change the way that you're living or change the way that you're doing things. So this trifold impact of European contact, disease, warfare on native populations forced many, many native groups to have to adapt politically. In some cases, Native communities essentially ceased to exist as a result of these things, leaving only a few survivors. 
these survivors were either forced to join other larger groups that were also experiencing the social and cultural impacts of demographic collapse. And the result was a phenomenon called coalescence. Here, remnant native communities impacted by war and disease would come together, they would form political alliances, and they would form larger confederacies that would allow them to collectively strengthen themselves against outside threats, both European and also other indigenous threats. This consequently was why the Wabanaki Confederacy was formed in the late 17th century, around 1680, we believe. The Confederacy protected its members from the threats of European newcomers to the East and also the threats of violent Iroquois enemies that existed to the West. During the late 17th century through the 18th century, the Wabanaki Confederacy was governed by a council of elected sachems. These were tribal leaders who were frequently in charge of the watershed that their village was on, and each member of the Confederacy would send sachems to the larger diplomatic meetings that were to create ideas or create plans for alliance or warfare concerning the entire Confederacy. Sachems themselves, themselves were more like respected listeners and debaters than simply autocratic rulers. They were often older members of extended families who had shown a talent for settling disputes, collecting food for the needy, and maintaining corporate resources of their communities. They were also very well educated in politics. And this was important in Wabanaki communities because politics looked a lot different than the political structures that we might think of uh, when we think about our government or a westward facing government. Wabanaki politics were fundamentally rooted on consensus. M many native tribes, but especially the Wabanaki Confederacy, did not believe in using force in order to coerce anybody to do something that they did not want to do. So politics and political, uh, political negotiations within the Confederacy were often achieved after much debate. Sachems frequently used stylized and metaphorical speech at council fires trying to win over other Sachems to see or join their side. And Sachems who were skilled at debate were often the ones who became the most influential within the Confederacy. And they were, for this reason, often called riddle men. One of the important things to note about Wabanaki history and the history of Native peoples across North America during this period is that Native peoples did not keep written records or histories. They did not have a written language, so they passed down traditions uh, from generation to generation through stories, myths, legends, drawings, maps, essentially oral history, what we would call it today. And this also shaped how Native peoples interacted with each other, both informal and and also informal settings. Wabanaki diplomacy and governments, for example, were, was conducted through word of mouth communication and oratory at large diplomatic meetings. This differs greatly from our perspectives on diplomacy, where interactions surrounding major historical events have for centuries been written down and recorded and really detailed so we can reference them in the future. So for those seeking to better understand Wabanaki or native history, these practices mean that we have no written record of Wabanaki history or events from these early periods, making it difficult for scholars or students of history to really understand how community life or diplomatic life functioned. What we do have is European observations of Wabanaki peoples and Wabanaki diplomacy, but this is problematic because often European observers were observing these events through a very skewed lens. Uh, they often overlooked really important things that they did not see as important, or they overlooked things that they simply did not understand. So these are issues that kind of come with understanding the structure and the development of Wabanaki political life, especially in these first years after European contact. But we can also look at archaeological material uh, and material culture sources, because these can give us a better understanding of Native perspectives, especially if we pair them with other sources that we have, maybe those text-based European sources. 
Influenced by diplomatic exchanges with their Huron allies to the west, the Wabanaki began using wampum belts, which are pictured to the right here, in their diplomacy in the 17th century. These wampum belts played an important role in maintaining Wabanaki political institutions, and the belts had very specific meanings depending on, on what was woven into the artwork. As you can see in this image, each wampum belt had a strand or had a, had a design on it, which stood for a message from one tribe to the Confederacy or from the Confederacy to a member of the tribe. These belts would be brought to a meeting and then read out loud at meetings by specifically designated members of the Confederacy. And the design on each belt did not necessarily stand for a precise word or a sentence, but it represented the main idea of the message and helped the delegate member who was reading or delivering the message remember what they were supposed to say as they were delivering it. The belts also held specific meaning based on the colors of the beads that were being used. Red symbolized war or a message of hostile intent while white symbolized peace. And certain combinations of colors like the white and blue pictured here suggested certain sentences or ideas to the narrator to again, help them remember what their message was, what they were trying to say. If you look at this image and look at the fourth wampum belt from the left, so the fourth one in, you can see uh, the unique design in the beadwork here that's actually a pipe. Uh, this is, tells us that this wampum belt would have likely been delivered to a hostile tribe in order to try to negotiate peace. In diplomatic meetings aimed at achieving peace, headmen or sachems from both sides would come together before negotiations to partake in a pipe smoking ceremony. And so pipes like this are often evident in Wabanaki artwork. They are woven into baskets, they're carved into pottery, they're etched into bir birch bark canoes because this pipe was such an important kind of physical marker of, okay, we're coming here to engage in a peaceful conversation. We're going to try to bridge the differences that we have in order to move forward as allies. So a widely used motif in Wabanaki artwork is uh, building off of the pipe, and it's actually a motif of a, a pipe smoking rabbit. And the history surrounding the use of the pipe smoking rabbit is not widely known, um, but rabbits are commonly used in Wabanaki myths and legends and stories as trickster figures. Uh, this is not just limited to the Wabanaki, many other Native American cultures uh, use the rabbit in myths and origin stories as well. But there are a number of Wabanaki myths where rabbits are central characters who either play tricks on human populations or on other animals. And so this is something that's a widely depicted motif on Wabanaki artwork and something that I just found was really interesting um, to kind of show the significance of the pipe and also the significance of mythology and storytelling in Wabanaki history and preserving Wabanaki culture. So historically, there were specific men's and women's roles in traditional Wabanaki society. Women tended gardens, carried wood and water, they crafted household utensils, they gathered medicines and food, they prepared and cooked meals, they prepared hides, they made clothes, snowshoes, and they, they set up and tore down the shelters that their families would need as they moved across the region from season to season. Politically, Wabanaki women were also the primary decision makers and were involved in all major decisions involving their community. While they usually did not speak or formally participate in these diplomatic meetings that we talked a little bit about before, they informally made their opinions known to Wabanaki men, influencing their decisions. Women also held veto power when it came to decisions regarding warfare. Men were not allowed to take the wampum to another community unless the women agreed to the, 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 the message that was being delivered. And all of this is to say that women held a very unique power in Wabanaki society. They were seen as having an innate power and a deep connection to the spiritual world because they gave life to their communities through childbirth. 
Older and elderly women, specifically grandmothers, were and continue to be highly respected in Wabanaki society because they were the ones that were tasked with passing on a lot of their wisdom, not only to younger women, but also to younger men who would end up being the future leaders of the Confederacy. And accomplished older women could achieve the title of a beloved woman in which Wabanaki society would give them expanded authority in times of warfare and diplomacy. Again, the history of Wabanaki women is not necessarily present or usually present in a lot of these European created sources from the colonial period. Because like I said before, a lot of these European male authors tended to overlook the presence of women at diplomatic meetings as simply not important. So we know that because we have these sources that really don't provide us with a clear or comprehensive view of Wabanaki history, we end up with problematic narratives that kind of put forth this idea that Wabanaki Wabanaki peoples and cultures are static. And more broadly, it ends up framing the trajectory of Native history through a lens of declension. In these types of narratives, these declension narratives, Native peoples and their cultures are seen as rapidly declining following the arrival of Europeans to America. Native peoples are forced to assimilate to survive and they gradually lose their cultural values, their languages, their life ways. Native peoples end up being literally pushed out of the story to live on reservations where the dominant historical US history narrative categorizes them as others. And they end up being not seen as or not seen as valued contributors to the dominant American narrative unless they're helping or assisting white people in achieving their goals of colonization or westward expansion. So when we think about US history narratives in this way, a few individuals probably come to mind. Squanto, the Wampanoag man who is heralded, heralded as helping the pilgrims and you know assisting and resulting in the first Thanksgiving. Sacagawea, the Shoshone woman who assisted the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then of course, perhaps most famously Pocahontas who's known for saving John Smith and ensuring the survival of Jamestown, which is a problematic narrative we can definitely get into in the question and answer session if you want to talk more about it. But in the colonial period, especially in the decades just before the American Revolution, we see that destructive wars and conflicts between Euro-American settlers and Wabanaki peoples are perpetuating these myths about native peoples and cultures and Wabanaki culture on the Massachusetts at the time of frontier. Tensions were largely over disputes about land and resources as Euro-American settlers infringed deeper onto Wabanaki territory and attempted to push Wabanakis onto smaller and smaller pieces of land. And conflicts over territory in these issues did not stop once Maine became a state. They did not end once America became an independent nation. They continued very much into the 19th century and still in many ways con continue to persist today. Even though the colonial period ended with American independence, Wabanaki peoples continued to experience these negative effects that came with colonialism because as we've stated a couple of times so far, they remained on their homelands as opposed to being removed to reservations or pushed off to other areas of North America like other Native American tribes during this period were. This push for westward expansion under the guise of manifest destiny, this idea that the United States and white American cultures were destined to spread from Atlantic to Pacific shaped US policy toward native peoples in the early 19th century. The federal government began in the 1790s by putting civilization policies in place throughout Eastern North America, which aimed to push native Americans toward Euro-American lifestyle practices. They pushed native men to give up hunting and other semi-nomadic activities in favor of semi-sedentary or sedentary activities like farming and ranching. Women who were traditionally the agriculturalists within their communities would be forced to give up that work to learn domestic skills and crafts like spinning and weaving that would keep them in the home. Native peoples would be required to learn how to read and write English. They would be required to convert to Christianity. And all of this was geared toward eliminating Native cultures and cultural practices so that Indigenous peoples would eventually assimilate into mainstream American society.
When these attempts at civilization failed to work, the US government ends up passing the Indian Removal Act in 1830, which ultimately led to the forced removal of thousands of native peoples from their homes east of the Mississippi to reservations west of the Mississippi, freeing up those lands in the east for white settlement. These ideas, which shaped US policy toward native peoples in the 19th century, are very much just a variation of colonialism. And we as scholars today call it settler colonialism. The goal of settler colonialism, as you can see in these examples, is to remove and erase indigenous peoples and cultures in order to take their lands for use in perpetuity. So even though Wabanaki peoples were not removed from their homelands like the Cherokee or the Creek or other native peoples in Eastern North America were, they deeply felt the effects of settler colonialism and they continue to feel the effects of these policies today. In the 19th century, both the state of Maine and private residents enacted numerous legal efforts to legally dispossess Wabanaki peoples of their lands. Laws imposed by the state restricted members of the Wabanaki Confederacy to reservations. This ran counter to traditional Wabanaki understandings about territory and homelands, which as stated before, rested on mobility and the ability to use land as their ancestors in previous generations had once used the land. By the late 19th and early 20th century, we see the creation of Native American boarding schools. These were institutions that removed indigenous children from their homes and communities, stripped them of their indigenous culture by forcing them to cut their hair, wear white styles of clothing, learn English, and change their names to European names. While at these boarding schools, which were often hundreds of miles away from their homes, Native children were educated in white American cultural practices. They were forbidden to speak their home languages or to interact with family members. Oftentimes they were not even able to go home to visit for school breaks or for holidays. And these actions had a profound effect on Native children for generations who often after leaving these boarding schools felt like they did not fit into this white American society that they were supposed to now fit into, but also felt like they had been so forcibly removed from their tribal lives that they could not go back and live on their reservations and be part of the Wabanaki community. Also in the 20th century, we see Wabanaki peoples experiencing discrimination in the child welfare system. Native children were being removed from their homes and were being placed in non-native foster care homes at significantly higher rates than white children over the course of the 20th century. Wabanaki peoples, along with other peoples, native peoples throughout the country, contested these practices as they saw them to be discriminatory and also not really taking into consideration native ideas about kin, native ideas about family, and feeling like state welfare agencies were not using culturally responsive techniques to understand why native families kind of function in the way that they did. By pushing back against these discriminatory practices, the Wabanaki and other native peoples were successful in passing the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978, which mandated that tribal governments be involved in welfare cases involving indigenous children. And this process, along with the ongoing process that's still ongoing today, to uncover the truth about these child welfare practices in 20th century Maine is the subject of a recent documentary that you may have heard of or you may be familiar with. It's called Dawnland. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you do. It's really um, eye-opening as to how these practices and the kind of ongoing practice of settler colonialism continues to impact Wabanaki communities and children today, resulting in generational trauma that is still experienced throughout the Wabanaki Confederacy. All of this is to say that settler colonialism continues to the present day and continues to perpetuate a lot of these problematic and untrue narratives of Native peoples that skew our understanding of Wabanaki history and culture through this westward facing lens. So probably the largest takeaway for us here tonight is to understand that 
it's easy for outsiders or people who are only familiar with one narrative or one perspective to believe that the native presence or native history in Maine and New England no longer exists. Or if it does exist, it's just limited to reservations. It's just limited to these small spaces that um, you know non-natives don't need to be concerned about. And we know that this is absolutely untrue. So by flipping our perspective, we can see how native culture is very much still a part of of, of our community and of our life and how it shapes the region in which we live. So in kind of moving forward, just to conclude a little bit, um, I wanted to just go through a couple of things that I usually do with my classes in order to highlight how native history and culture in Maine and New England is still extremely vibrant and extremely visible today. Wabanaki peoples are integral to shaping not only how we view the history of this region, but how we understand current day issues and how we build our communities. So I wanted to take a few minutes to share this map, for example. This relates uh, very much, I think, to our original uh, framework of flipping our narrative, trying to face, e face East when we examine Native American history and examine US history. And I think in Maine, one of the best ways to do this is through language, which is very visible to us through place names. If we flip our perspective in Maine, we can easily see that English is the foreign language here. Uh, and that's evident in the place names that we still are familiar with and that we still use today. If you look toward the bottom of this image, Saco, of course, Saco River, we're all familiar with that. That comes from the Abenaki term, meaning where the river flows out. The area's inhabitants here in the early 1600s referred to them by the same name, as I'm sure you're very familiar with. Ogunquit, even a little bit further down, is the Abenaki term for sandbar lagoon at the river mouth, which I've never seen the river, but from what I've read, maybe you've seen it as well. This is a very accurate name because the riverbed is apparently very sandy where it kind of enters into the Atlantic. Uh, Presumpscot, as in the Presumpscot River, Abenaki for rough places river or ledges in channel, both of which aptly describe the waterfalls that are found on the river. And then a couple of other ones, if we kind of look toward the center and then toward the left of this image, we have Molly Wocket and Molly Ocket. Both of these places are named after Mary, Ag Mary Agatha, or also known as Molly Ocket, a Pigwocket woman who lived in the 18th century. So this is just an example of place names in Western Maine. There are many, many more. Um, and this image actually comes from an interactive map that was created uh, by Bates College. So if you're interested, um, once I stop sharing my screen, I can put the link to that in the chat. And uh, if you want to interact with it and kind of poke around, it's a really, really interesting source. But Wabanaki history and culture is also very visible through art and craft work and canoe building. And so one of the things I try to do in my classes as well is highlight how these crafts are still very important for shaping how we think about Maine, uh, canoe building, especially when we think about transportation that it, and the topography and geography of Maine, how central a canoe was for so long for helping people of both indigenous and non-indigenous backgrounds travel and get around. In the 19th century as a way to preserve both connections to traditional homelands and to find new economic opportunities, Wabanaki peoples began making and selling baskets, modifying more utilitarian forms of basket making to really cater to European interests and desires. From about 19, uh, 1850 to 1930, basket making boomed as Wabanaki people connected with tourists in the region. And by 1900, basket making was the primary source of income for many Wabanaki families, which allowed them to support an independent way of life that mirrored the traditional mobility of traveling to the coast in the summer and then traveling back inland for winter when they were done selling baskets for the season. Wabanaki peoples also continue to make birch bark canoes as pictured here. 
a skill that's been perfected for thousands of years as Wabanaki people traveled rivers and streams and other inland waterways. Like the baskets, Wabanaki birch bark canoes are uh, something that was really important to Wabanaki ancestors. And the practice of both of these things, both creating baskets and creating the canoes, perpetuates this idea of connecting to the land and connecting to the territory in the same way that one's ancestors did. It takes about 700 hours to build a single canoe from finding and gathering the materials that are necessary to build it to actually completing the boat to be able to use it as we see here in this picture to the right. So the bark and uh, just gathering the bark, gathering the roots, the um, other materials that are needed in order to create the canoe really connects native peoples to the land and again, perpetuates and preserves these practices that had been practiced essentially the same way by Wabanaki ancestors. Finally, Wabanaki culture continues to be highly visible through the persistence of myths, legends, and local histories. Some uh, tell us about Wabanaki origins or how Wabanakis preserve their historical origins and tales about their historical origins. Uh, this is seen in the myth and legend of Gluskop. Uh, Gluskop was a heroic, wise, powerful figure who was viewed by the Wabanaki as the creator of their people. There are many variations of Gluskop's story and each of the tribes in the Wabanaki Confederacy have their own version of the Gluskop myth and there are many myths surrounding his actions. But essentially in pretty much every version uh, of the creation story, at least, Gluskop is believed to have made the world habitable for human beings by creating and arranging landforms, giving animals their characteristics, and eliminating many monsters. So the Gluskop teachings are passed down from generation to generation through oral histories, languages, songs, and it, it, it basically Gluskop is important on many levels, but the Gluskop stories are meant to ensure mutual responsibility and teach children that they have an obligation to respect the spiritual world and respect the animal world that they share this physical space, space with. They teach about the reciprocal relationship between people and animals in the environment. And they also highlight the significance of place-based history for indigenous peoples. And again, allows us to understand how space and place inform indigenous spiritual traditions, ceremonies, and ideologies. Some legends and local histories have emerged as a result of Native and Euro-American contact and have come to shape the understandings of the reason, uh, the region, like I'm sure as most of you are familiar with, the Curse of the Saco River. According to the legend, in the summer of 1675, three sailors from an English ship that was anchored at the mouth of the Saco River departed by rowboat, approaching a group of Native Americans, including a man named Squandro, when the sailors saw Squandro's pregnant wife and infant son, they decided to test the European belief that an Indian baby could swim upon birth as animals do. The infant sank, the mother dove in and retrieved him, and the baby unfortunately soon died as a result of the incident. According to the legend, Squandro mourned for three days, but then in a fit of rage, cursed the river saying that the river would quote, claim three lives a year until all white men fled its banks. Conflict between Squandro's people and European settlers persisted and ultimately actually led to one of the first blows in King Philip's war. But as you know, the myth and the legend has persisted long after the actual conflicts have and local belief about the curse of the Saco River still holds strong and continues to this day. So the history of the incident and the involvement of Squandro's people in King Philip's war and everything that kind of happened after that is rarely disputed. But many people view the curse with skepticism, even though, again, it's conceivable that over the span of, you know, historical record, uh, three people per year could feasibly die in the Saco River. So it makes sense that this curse has had such a long lasting kind of impact and uh, history of its own. But for many, you know, many believe that the curse actually has its roots in the undertow of the river, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, you know, the river is narrow, it has deep gorges, there's a stronger current near the river's basin or the, the riverbed uh, than there is at the top of the river. So there are a lot of different views and debates over the 
history of the curse of the Saco River. But this curse has very much shaped local history, not only in Saco and Biddeford, but also in southern Maine and even in New England. And as I was even learning about it and reading up on it a little bit, you see New England ma magazines from across the region talking about the curse of the Saco River. And to me, it seems like it's come to very much shape social memory in the region. Social memory is how a group uh, comes to see itself and kind of understand its identity in relation to shared perceptions of the past or certain historical events. It relies on shared experiences, shared interpretations, and it's shaped by how people choose to preserve and kind of absorb these interpretations into their present day communities and present day cultures. So the curse of the Saco River is definitely a complex one and I'm happy to keep talking about it. Um, I think I've gone over my time a little bit. We're at 7.50, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, we'll see if we have any questions in the chat. And um, I'm happy to stay in chalk for a few minutes after eight o'clock if anybody um, if anybody would like to just talk about some of the some of the information here. Thanks. <laughs>